All right, good morning, good afternoon, or perhaps good evening, wherever and whoever you are. Uh, my name is Ben McLeish uh, of Altmetric, and we would like to welcome you to today's webinar on planning effective institutional outreach for 2018, for which we are very lucky to have with us uh, to guide us through um, how uh, they have used Altmetric to promote research across something other than just the academic uh, research life cycle. Uh, we have with us uh, today um, Joachim Schnabel and Oliver Wren, both of ETH Zurich. Uh, myself, Ben McLeish, I realized actually, gentlemen, that you have extremely good headshots. And I then decided to try and find one of my own. And alas, I only have terribly poorly lit Facebook uh, shots. So I opted for something that would be recognizable, I suppose, to uh, anybody who has been playing with Google's latest uh, uh, arts uh, app download. So that's as close as I have. I look a lot like William Cadogan Symes, apparently, a man who died at the age of 51. So it's a, a positive onward and upward view from me. Um, I'll just be uh, introducing Altmetric today and then I'll hand over to Joachim and Oliver later on. And on the subject of how we will organize things, uh, we are recording the webinar for anyone who is wondering that recording has begun. Um, if there are questions you would like to um, ask the panelists, either Joachim or um, Oliver, there is a Q&A, a questions box that is uh, should be appearing in the software um, that you're using, the GoToWebinar software. Please pop those in there. And if you have questions for us at Altmetric or Digital Science in general, please drop those in there as well. Having said that, if you have some issues with audio or video, which we hope, of course, you are not, um, you can drop those into the chat box instead of the Q&A box. And Josh Clark, who is uh, our marketing uh, colleague and myself will be keeping an eye on those uh, throughout the webinar as well. And of course, we will be sending uh, the slides as well as the webinar recording itself out to everyone who joined us today from what looks like uh, quite a, a wide range of countries and locations. Um, and we will, of course, answer the questions at the end rather than going through, uh, unless there is something perhaps that uh, strikes us as particularly worthy of a question throughout, uh, perhaps we can do that as well. A quick overview then of who digital science, or rather who Altmetric are. So Altmetric belongs to the digital science portfolio of companies. There are between 12 and 14 now, depending on how you count them, all doing various kinds of bits of research management, whether it's to do with reading, whether it's to do with data uh, management, whether it's to do even with uh, automated robotics uh, in the laboratories in the cloud, we go that far. But Altmetric itself, we deal uh, with tracking attention to research outputs outputs that are from non-traditional sources and providing those in a way that is intuitive, easy to understand, visually interesting and engaging, and uh, most importantly, uh, auditable and machine readable. That's what we like. Uh, that's what we do. We've been doing it for, wow, close to a long time now, my goodness. I think we were founded in 2010. And actually, um, what is rather nice about this webinar is that Oliver and Joachim belong to what I consider probably to be our very first European uh, institutional um, customer for Altmetric for Institutions. You were the first back in December of 2014. So it'd be very interesting to hear how you've uh, dealt with the product since then and some of the strategies you've used. So once again, uh, welcome to, uh, to, to that. So a quick update so that Joachim and Oliver don't have to do it themselves. Um, what is it that Altmetric really tracks? We differ from traditional media monitoring in that we don't look for um, uh, attention to keywords or attention to phrases uh, or any of the uh, emerging social media tracking that you might be aware of. Instead, um, we decided from the beginning to track very particular references to um, outputs to publications themselves. And the way that we do that is, of course, by either following domains like nature.com, sciencedirect.com, archive.org, or things like that. But ultimately, we are relying on uh, being able to track, ultimately, in some way, a reference to a um, published identifier. Most of the time, those are DOIs or PubMed IDs. But as you can see, over the years, we have added more and more um, items so that we can pick up attention to economics works, for example, uh, or institutional handles that are in a repository so that when a news article or a blog links to a repository item, we're picking that up as well. 
And for our more advanced clients, uh, increasingly we are also then tracking attention to perhaps their press releases that are on their website. In that case, what we're doing is treating that website as if it were an output itself and relying on the metadata of that website itself to, to track where your blog was mentioned or where your press release was shared in the news, for example. Those are uh, more custom ways of using um, our service. Uh, we have a new slide for 2018 um, put together by a new colleague of ours. Um, this means that we are tracking an enormous amount of data out there. Um, uh, we are looking in particular sources for references to these links to these uh, uh, published identifiers. Uh, so at the moment we track about 50,000 policy documents from organizations like the World Health Organization. Uh, with that, we're even picking up items in the reference lists of those PDFs, even when they do not mention a DOI because we're clever enough to write algorithms that can recognize a citation and then can go back and try and work out what DOI that might be, for example. We look for attention to your research in blogs, in news sites, which of course are in multiple languages because we are still looking for that link to a DOI or to a PubMed ID or whatever. And we uh, mine three different languages worth of Wikipedia and do plan to add more as uh, time goes on. So we take all of that attention across social media, across news, across post-publication peer review, for example, even academic syllabi, and we aggregate that all into one um, details page for each particular item that we are tracking. Uh, now that has meant that we have now reached uh, over 62 million mentions of research across the web and that we are now have found over 14 million items which have at least been mentioned one time. So of course there are many more publications out there than that but those have as far as we can tell never actually been talked about online but the great thing is that that trend is upwards and people and platforms and uh, internet users are increasingly sharing and discussing and commenting on research or research data or really anything that has an identifier at all um, out there so that we can uh, see that it is an immense database when we first started with eth zurich i think we were at maybe four million items maybe five something like that uh, so it has grown by a lot we see something like 150,000 new items every month detected we don't just provide you massive numbers and say good luck with all that um, we do actually provide uh, an intuitive interface that will display the institutional outputs uh, by author, by department, uh, in total, and even provide a way of looking at it so you can see it over time. This actually is, I hope you don't mind, gentlemen, a screenshot of your own uh, attention uh, at uh, the uh, ETH uh, DCHAB, DCAB, uh, the um, Chemical and Mathematical, no, is it Chemical and Physical Sciences, I believe. Do correct me when, uh, when you finally come on. Um, but you can see very quickly the breakdown, and so you can see what is happening. You can see by author. You can get alerts for this stuff. Uh, you can build reports on it, or you could even, if you are super smart and good at computers, uh, unlike myself, uh, which you can probably tell because I said the phrase good at computers, uh, we have also a full API for this so that not only can you embed our data in your repositories or your newsletters or anywhere else where you would like to put these, but you can um, query uh, our database for your account, for uh, your attention to particular items from a particular author or from a department in total uh, or across a particular timeline, uh, any kind of way that's useful for answering your questions about how has the outreach happened? Uh, how, you know, what, what sort of outreach has occurred? How can we improve it? Uh, is it positive or negative? We can go and have a look at the data themselves. Whoops, I will now hand over to Oliver and to Joachim in that I will promote them uh, as they well uh, deserve to be uh, to um, a presenter. There we go. And there we go, Joachim, let me know uh, when you've been able to get that. And don't forget to unmute yourself as well, sir. Can you hear us? I can, sir, and we can see your screen. Perfect. And you can hear us? Crystal clear, it's quite wonderful. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll start with a quick introduction. Um, okay. 
So where we are, we are at ADH Zurich, which is also known as Federal, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. It's one of the two universities in Zurich. And ETH Zurich has about 20,000 students and two campuses, actually one in the city and one up on the hill, the Hungerberg, where we are located and where we are surrounded by cows and sheep. So that's a very nice place. Uh, we are both uh, lecturers at ETH Zurich. We are both chemists and we are no librarians. Uh, so this is a quick introduction to us where we work so we both have double heads we work both for two units the first one is the chemistry biology pharmacy information center which has been a library in the past which is somehow still a library but which acts as a information skill center at the university that's why we teach a lot um, why we do this there's so many information resources and solutions available which are mostly and unfortunately underutilized and that's why we try to bring this to students and researchers' attentions and actually into their research workflow. And as a member of science communication for the Department of Chemistry and Applied Biosciences, uh, that's the abbreviation DCAP, um, we are in charge of uh, securing that the public and also the scientific community is informed about our research output. Why we were interested in altmetrics, uh, there could be an easy answer because we love donuts. Um, that's just kidding. Um, we realized that there's a growing number of, of articles as Ben mentioned, and that they, uh, the time you have for reading articles stays about the same, but there are more and more articles. So you, you need to somehow filter uh, that help you to decide what is necessary to read, what is forced to read. And we thought well, altmetrics could one of be one of those filters that help uh, going through the, the increasing amount of, of papers. We were also asked when you first heard about Admetrix and I searched my hard drive and I found uh, the first entry by September 2013 from an internal um, content management system, InfoFlow, which is a WordPress blog internally, where we post everything which we think is exciting in information science landscape. So that was in September 2013. Then we learned about Altmetrics when suddenly two people we worked together from ACS decided to leave ACS and work for Altmetric. Uh, one is Ben, another image uh, from the, the Google app. And I then love I that attended, one so much. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and that then I fun. attended the uh, first Altmetric conference in London in September 2014, where I met these four inventors of research altmetrics, Jason Bream, Paul Kroot, uh, Dario and Cameron. And they presented their altmetric manifesto, uh, which said, well, we need somehow to have filters uh, to go through the scholarly literature to find out what, what is important. And the other reason is why we are interested in altmetrics. We want researchers to easily see who is attracted by their research because if you are cited somewhere in another paper, that's not very interesting. You want to know who is talking about my research, how they are talking about the research. That's very interesting. And we wanted to have an easy way to figure out where and how people are talking about my research. Um, so with that, I hand over to Joachim. Thank you, Ben, for the introduction. Thank you, Oliver. So let me start uh, with the most technical part. And what you can see here is uh, the publication list on the homepage of our department. And it doesn't look technical at all. Let me quickly explain to you what's behind it. So um, this publication list we built ourselves. Um, and it's basically using two APIs. The one API is from Scopus. And the reason to use the Scopus API is that we wanted to show, to be able to show the publications list once they appear in Scopus, so almost in real time. And while we're already building this list and feeding live data from Scopus, we were thinking, well, not why not just also take the old metric data in? And this is um, why we also use the old metric API. And as you can see here, um, the small donuts, the three donuts that are shown on the on the image. Um, so whenever you want to show old metric data for publications where it's available, you can click on show old metric data and you have the data. 
And uh, we are very proud that since last year, this also works on mobile devices, finally. You can, of course, check this out yourself and go to our department's homepage uh, slash publications. Um, then uh, the, the question was, how have we used the old metric ex explorer for institutions? Ben showed you a screenshot in the introduction. So um, what we did uh, early last year is we sent a, a science communication report to the department. And this is not only about alt metrics, we also showcased the metrics in general. So first of all, um, we were showing what's the output of the department. This means how many papers were published at all, um, which are the most popular journals, which were the subject areas and so on. And of course, we also um, took this opportunity and, and also showed the old metrics that were generated. And on the right uh, side of this screen, you can see that uh, we showcased some of the some of the publications that went out and we just uh, more or less randomly choose some sources uh, here the uh, faculty for thousand then some news outlets and wikipedia this is not to show which has the the most uh, the highest score or the most mentions this is more to spread uh, the awareness of old metric or old metrics in general a little bit more because uh, people that are involved in libraries like we are we know a lot of about old metrics but the researchers are not yet fully aware of this so with this report, we wanted also to spread the awareness that they can easily find out um, who is mentioning their research online. And what I like a lot about the old metric explorer is that you can really um, easily filter all the news uh, or like news items or mentions online or even policy documents with a couple of clicks. And this is also one thing I'd like to mention that whenever a researcher approaches me and has questions about old metric, I usually um, lead them to the explorer and let them do things by themselves and it's really a nice intuitive interface so actually nobody needs help um, and they, they find their way through this because it's it's a great visualization and then the great tool to just get started right away um, i mentioned policy documents because um, for us these are of course one of the most uh, interesting sources to track unfortunately we are only in the two digit numbers of all of our publications but um, for instance, if as a researcher uh, or as a good example for us, you want to see um, where your research was mentioned, and this is a good place to showcase this. For instance, here's the EU policy document on the review on nanomaterials. These are great, uh, great pages to show. Um, also for people who are uh, critical about uh, all the metrics or old metrics in general. Then, um, as Oliver mentioned before, we also do science communication. And whenever there is an article either written by ETH News or by the depart by us, by the department, then uh, we of course highlight this as news on our homepage. And with the help of the old metric explorer, we can then immediately um, see if this news is actually um, read and mentioned or um, shared online. And this is an example of a couple of weeks ago where ETH News showcased one of our professor's research results they had developed a light sensitive um, derivative of the molecule THC from cannabis. And this is the old metric detail page about it. On the very bottom, you see the ETH news in German and English on January 9. This was actually published. And uh, when you go up, you see from other news outlets how they picked it up and spread it. And this is only the news tab. I'm not showing you Twitter or blogs or anything else. So it is really, really interesting to actually track our own efforts when we do science communication. Then how do we um, promote these old metric tools? So how do we spread awareness and uh, show people what's possible? So um, one thing I have to mention are the coffee lectures. So this is a format that's now about five years old. So soon we are entering the 14th session of coffee lectures. What is a coffee lecture? So during the semester, we have nine coffee lectures. This is a, a short, a really short, only 10 minute course about any topic of interest, being it research tools, databases, or um, something uh, useful you can do with your computer. And it's from one to 10 past one. And the idea is after lunch, you're for sure going to have a coffee somewhere and why not come to us, have your free coffee and learn something about, for instance, Altmetric. 
I show you here the coffee lecture card. This is the small um, collectible card. You can get this at our coffee lectures and then you have the, all the information we talk about in 10 minutes is even distilled down to this uh, small card where you have the, the URLs and a uh, short summary of uh, what you learned during this lecture. So that's uh, that's one thing how we how we use it for teaching. Then what I have to mention is uh, our internal publication called the Infozine. It's freely available. And uh, a little more than one year ago, we actually we published the first special issue of Infozine, and it was about metrics and research. And it's I really can recommend to all of you listeners to download this at the Infocentrum homepage. And it's about uh, metrics. Um, there are pros, cons, and the, the authors of this publication are from um, researchers, professors, their PhD students, publishers, and even Ben has written an article, uh, article about, about old metric. So um, have a look. And uh, then whenever there is a, a discussion about metrics in general, you have a, a big wealth of information and, and uh, opinions of a broad range of people. Then um, how do we spread awareness also to the public? So I have to mention this because um, we also do some uh, outreach for the general public here. So for instance, there is the Open Lab Day, this is the flyer that you see on the left side. In March, there will, uh, there will school classes will come and have a look around our department and see into the labs. But they are also um, uh, attending some of our information, of our lectures, of our courses. And we are also there as the uh, Info Centrum giving some talks. And on the right hand side of the screen, you see the science fair, the Scientifica. This takes place every two years and it's a, a joint fair from ETH Zurich and University of Zurich. And last year, we also had the, the opportunity to give a talk there where we also mentioned um, about how data from scientists is generated and how this is mentioned online. And of course, there I was, was also showcasing old metric because it made much sense in this context. And for the school classes that, about, that are about to come next month, um, it depends always on the age. So I, I can never predict if there, there are 12 year olds or 17 year olds and, and always depending um, which classes they are from. I, uh, I always mention old metric, but it always depends on what I'm showing them. And this is, this is an example I, I showed to them. So the younger um, audience, I would always uh, uh, mention how actually the research gets eventually into a Wikipedia page because uh, also the younger students know Wikipedia. And then I would say, well, um, if you if you publish a paper and someone writes about you on Wikipedia, then you can actually see this here you know, on the Altmetric page, very well summarized. And um, for the for the older students, the students that are about to uh, be a university student soon, I have this example for this uh, sodium magnesium battery. This is a battery that uh, that is not dependent on lithium, and it, it was published a couple of years ago here at the Department of Chemistry. And there I show um, the different uh, news outlets. So for instance, this is a more traditional paper, the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, and how they write about this, uh, this research, how they pick it up. And then as a, as a contrast, I also show a different newspaper, a newspaper that uses larger letters in the headlines to show how, how actually this, this side of the, of the research, how it is viewed by them. And uh, with this, I give back to Oliver. So Outlook, what, what we are doing next, so we will continue educating new students on research metrics with the coffee lectures, but we have also every fall semester, we are teaching a PhD course, which has a very long title, Scientific Information Retrieval and Management in Chemistry and Life Sciences, where research metrics is also a topic. We hope to be soon able to send out more personalized reports for researchers. Uh, we have to be careful because ETH Zurich has signed DORA, the San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment, and there's a, a big deal of skepticism, even criticism at the department, at the Department of Chemistry and Applied Biosciences about metrics. Uh, that was also one reason why you have might seen it, the list of publications, the metric donuts are not shown by default. Um, you have to click yes, show me automatic data to see it. That's uh, worse because some people didn't like uh, 
these research metrics. So default is no research metrics and you have to actively decide you want to see it. And what we always mention is that the number in this case, uh, 657 is not a score. It's an indicator. It doesn't tell you which paper is better or stronger. It just tells you how likely it is to find readers through the media. And also what we are doing and what we will continue doing is helping researchers uh, to improve uh, the outreach, not only outreach to the journal article, which is cited by other researchers, uh, by other specialists in the field, but we want to help them to reach also the public with lay summaries. And that's why we are partnering with Kudos, where they easily can write a plain, easy to understand title, write what's about in plain natural language and explain why is it important. And hopefully this will also increase the outreach of our research, which is important uh, for us because we are getting most of our money, money from the Swiss taxpayer. So we want to show the Swiss taxpayer that is really well invested Swiss francs, uh, giving it to ETH Zurich. Okay. Question. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's great. Um, I actually have a couple of questions for you before we dive into some of the other uh, items because we have a couple of questions already. Some of them for us, some of them for perhaps you. Um, what is the most surprising kind of attention you think you've received over the time in which you've been able to sort of see uh, what is um, what, what has been talked about in, in all metric? Did you come across any very unusual types of attention? Yeah, we just see that uh, during the last couple of years, when we, when we started having a new website uh, doing science communication, which just started three years ago, that there's a correlation with the increase of mentions. Um, so we are not sure if it's because we, we started working on it or, or not, but actually that's something nice that you see. We started science communication. We, we, started doing things and uh, the number of mentions increased at the very same time. Interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question for Joachim that's been handed in by uh, Rowena Harding. Um, she says, uh, I'm amazed at the idea of imparting knowledge in only 10 minutes. How do you get the level of information right for such a short time span? That's a good question. Well, you cannot talk about every, every detail, of course, but um, usually what we do is hands-on tutorials. So we are actually showing something live on screen and have one or two examples that we, that we go through. Yeah, you can make people excited in 10 minutes, but you cannot fully explain something. But most important is to get them getting excited about something because then they start asking or they start using it. Um, so it, the excitement is in the focus. That's why we try to make it as entertaining as possible. Right, fantastic. Um, and here's another one. Uh, what messaging has changed uh, resistance from your colleagues, if any? Have you found that there is um, certain ways of talking about this kind of, um, I suppose, this, this kind of a, attempt to reach the public that if you tune it differently, have you have you found it easier to, I suppose, for want of a better word, sell internally? Well, we, there's a, looks like to us there's an increasing interest on what they do at ETH Zurich. Um, so that there, there's a need to explain what we do and because most of the people realized we, we need to do it. There's more openness for these kind of things. Yeah. In Have my opinion, it's, it's, it's yeah. also important, you know, um, many people uh, use everything, you know, all the social media, Twitter, Facebook, and some also don't use anything at all of this. So no social media at all, but still they, they read the, the online newspapers or still they, they are interested in policy documents, for instance. So it's sometimes uh, really important that you uh, actually focus on those sources and leave yeah. away the, let's say, the blue parts of the donut. Right, sure. Um, I do have, uh, because there are some questions about um, things like the score and stuff, I've got uh, some, some slides on that, well, a, a couple of uh, links later on to give to people. Um, there are some here that I, I will have to answer myself. Um, so this is actually a good one, and for this one I'll perhaps take 
the uh, control of the um, deck back, if that's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's remind myself of how to do that once again. Um, the question concerns how we um, how we track um, attention to your actual specific outreach, like your the blogs you're writing, uh, or the press release that you are doing. Uh, this is this is not something I think that we do for the ETH at the moment, but there are. Um, um, other organizations out there, actually in Switzerland, I'm going to use an example from Switzerland, where the blog that this institute writes, they want to have considered as if it were a publication from a journal or a book chapter or something like that. And so here's my example for it. These are the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. They're just down the road, <laughs> not really just down the road, they're in Geneva. Um, and in addition to writing journal articles, and publishing in you know what we would consider to be traditional outputs, they do also maintain a very popular blog about you know things like like you can see here fast facts about malnutrition. And if I just go down it, this is just on their website in the Knowledge Center. Um, you can see there's some general information, the economic impact, what they want to do about it, uh, the sort of the market activities that Gain is doing. And you can see as we go down here, there's a good decent amount of uh, information. It's laid out nicely. There are some citations, of course, but there is no identifier itself for this item because, of course, it's just a blog entry. I say just a blog entry. It is an entry that's just been put on the website. It didn't go through any review process. There are no automatic uh, standardized metadata approaches for, on a publisher level. But in the background of this uh, website, helpfully, they have something called a canonical URL. This basically is sometimes the same as the URL that you will see up here. But it means that even if you were to go to this link via a bit.ly link, the website is still it's got this tag here, which means that um, Altmetric can come along uh, if it's listening if it's listening out for that particular domain. So Gain told us we would like to track uh, this attention, please. So we added uh, what is it? Gainhealth.org to our list of websites that we listen out for, along with Nature, alongside you know Springer's websites, alongside Wiley, and so forth. And so anytime that there is a link online, even if it is via Bitly or another shortening service that resolves to the GAIN website. We, uh, our system knows not to just ignore it like most of the other traffic in, on the web, but to actually pick it up and keep it. And then there are other items on this metadata page that uh, help us to populate uh, the uh, track tracking for it. So we can see the type, it happens to be called an article. They've got a title here, Fast Facts About Malnutrition, and they have a bit of a, a description. They could have also added a date. They didn't do that in this case. They've got some standard upload dates, but it's not um, the, the way that we would use it. But you could have that. And that was enough for us to create custom badges for that blog entry, or let's say press release, or images, or anything else that you want to put out and you want to see whether it's being picked up. And as you can see, this uh, particular blog entry uh, has been in the news. Uh, this is something that has uh, made its way into uh, proper um, you know, tier one news organizations or onto MSN. Um, not always for great reasons, I suppose, um, and it changes over time. So it, it, there are different reasons why uh, this has been picked up up across, what is it, December 2015 to November 2016. Similarly, somebody else has linked that uh, to blogs as well. So Cafe Hayek linked about it. It's been on Twitter, so you can see we picked it up, even though it was in, um, uh, in a short link. So uh, we, we can handle that kind of thing. Um, so we can do that. The second part of the question that I'm answering here is that this is a the only, <clears throat> it's, sorry, it's the only bespoke part of our service, which would only be prospective. In other words, we have to begin listening out for your site in order to then pick up the links. We can't go back in time like we could do with the uh, ETH when uh, they switched on their service because uh, we had already been listening out since at least 2011. We tend to peg our data to be sort of January 2012 onwards, really, but there is a bit of a long tail back into the past. Uh, and with policy, it goes back into the 1920s because, of course, we can pick up those old documents that refer to something that now in the present has been given a DOI retrospectively. Um, but with this, we have to begin at a certain point and then we are listening out for it going forwards. So it is available to any of our customers, but it has to be implemented by us um, and requires you to have those bits of metadata on your website. So that is, uh, I hope, a clarification to something that I did gloss over uh, slightly before. Um, 
let's see. Um, I am just looking for, ah, yes, okay. Uh, this is, uh, again, another one for me. Uh, please explain why a URL shortener does not count into the alt metric. Uh, it does. So we recognized very quickly that um, on Facebook, on Google, um, in blogs, and on Twitter and in many other places, people use short links to ultimately link to research. So they don't always use the link, you know, nature.com forward slash whatever it is. Um, they tend to use um, Google's shortener, they use the Facebook shortener, Twitter automatically shortens every link. And so we wrote a piece of software that's it's actually in the uh, public domain uh, called Embiggen. <laughs> I think it comes from The Simpsons. Um, and uh, what it does is it tracks six and a half thousand different short linking services and resolves them every time it sees one. Um, and then looks for uh, whether it's uh, resolving to a place that we know has research. So we actually do pick up amongst the hardest um, types of research to find. Uh, when I say hardest, I mean it's essentially impossible to find this stuff manually because Twitter has a historical search of something like 24 hours. Uh, and then of course the tweets are still somewhere online, but you can't find them via the interface easily anymore. And then if you were to search uh, online for links, you know, just embed, you know, search the link in a search box on Google, you wouldn't find these because they are shortened. So we have uh, made sure that we um, uh, can, can sort of uh, handle that. So I hope that that clears that. Um, Okay, here's another one for ETH. Um, I found that providing researchers with stats generally encourages them to communicate more with the public. Have you seen that trend using old metrics? Yeah, that's hard to tell. So we, we do not have figures, we have just gut feeling. And with gut feeling, I would say yes. And also with a publication yep. list, they can can click on show me automatic data and they can see if their paper has a donut or if, uh, and yeah, that's most likely also causing some openness because they can see the immediate benefit and especially if it's a policy document or Wikipedia or if it's a good uh, newspaper like uh, NZZ or New York Times. Uh, that changes a lot, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm going to ask a composite question now. Uh, this is partly mine and also partly one that I've received on here. So when you say good newspaper articles, um, I suppose we mean things like famous ones. Um, have you come across um, any needed action when it comes to what we would term, I suppose, in this modern era as fake news i hate that term so much um but have you found that you have you have uh, had to deal with um mi not misattribute uh, misattributing but misuse of research or research that has just become part of entirely uh, i suppose radical or, or um unpleasant or just downright false um online coverage have you had to deal with any of that um, so actually, when uh, when we were preparing this uh, scientific uh, outreach report for 2016, I first had YouTube in because there were some mentions on YouTube as well that you track. Mm -hmm. But then I actually looked at one of the videos and uh, it was not fake news per se. It was just something extremely weird with some parts of propaganda videos. And then I just realized th there was a huge list of, of references and one of our papers was in there. So I decided to just take this out again because it was it was mostly weirdness, not not something like fake news. It didn't just make sense when you watch this. I don't know, maybe it was also a bot putting this up. I didn't understand it, but so the strange things, but the real fake news, no, I, I, real fake news. That's a nice term. I didn't come across this, no. But I actually, I must say, I haven't looked into all of the news items for a particular um, uh, uh, paper. I would say you 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 rather focus on the ones that you that you know. Yeah, I understand. Um, I'll add to that. Um, we are always thinking about how to treat news um, because, for example, there are many sites that are really just uh, reproducing press releases and our customers want those. They, they want to know where press is, uh, so press releases are being issued. So PR Newswire or Eureka Alert or things like that. So we do pick them up. We, we always think about how we would want to um, uh, construct these online in the future, how we want to lay them out. Uh, there's another one, which is syndication. Sometimes you see um, 
uh, many, many, many times the same news story uh, that has been syndicated across an enormous amount of platforms. And so we're always thinking about how we would, you know, do we score them the same way? Do we collapse the list so that there would be one reference and then there's all the places where it's appeared? Because, you know, our, our customers still want to know like those kinds of numbers, right? And then of course, um, we, we do track Breitbart News um, because like it or not, they are uh, still linking to uh, research and uh, they they just about qualify as something above uh, Infowars or something even more crazy. Of course, we have to also remind ourselves that um, the, the real fake news phenomenon did hinge on entirely invented stories without any citations. Uh, that was the most extreme end of it, of course. And of, of course, we don't pick those up because um, a, they, since they wouldn't link to any uh, items, they wouldn't appear in our database anyway. They're not a point of, uh, they're not a source of attention. And there is, uh, we don't just track everything online. There is a curated list of those uh, websites, which we always add to. We always add new news sites um, in, uh, you know, in, in different countries and as they come online. Uh, and so something that would be quite evidently pretending to be ABC News, but it isn't. So abcnews.com.org, for example. Uh, which I think is actually a real example. It's pretending to be ABC News, but it isn't. That wouldn't even be something that would come into our um, uh, system anyway, because it is a misrepresentation of what is a real news source, which would, of course, be ABC News. Um, that's a great question, actually. I, I've not um, vocalized that in a long time. Uh, so yeah, it's, it came up a little bit last year for reasons I'm sure you can imagine. Um, maybe, and maybe in just, addition to the syndicated content, my experience is that syndicated content never really has a source because when I came across uh, those reports, uh, I realized uh, if you Google it, you find a similar text on many sites, but never the source. And usually if I'm able to retrieve the source, I realize that the content of the original source is quite different. And uh, so I think they, they don't really count because there's no resource related. There's just a mention of Swiss scientists or Sweden researchers or whatever. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting one. I've got another one for you, actually, gentlemen. Um, is there a role for relationship building with the press or bloggers, et cetera? So I suppose you are him. Um, are you um, going so far as to almost act like a PR person and cur you're curating a list of, of people that you are deliberately reaching out to with certain research? Or do you find that you're increasingly being contacted by people? people again uh, about stories or um, that you're, you know, I, I don't know, you, uh, I suppose optimizing content for reuse on blog platforms, are you doing any of that kind of stuff or anything else? Um, so this is mostly done through the uh, corporate communications of, uh, of ETH Zurich. So they have the direct contact to all the newspapers, to the local uh, radio and TV stations. This is not done by us, but if you have a, like, like if you have an idea or a researcher approaches me, then uh, we would certainly go together to Hochschulkommunikation, which is the department, and they will then uh, contact their press contacts. Yeah. So sometimes they ask us if we recommend a media or a person, and most likely that's the way that we try to convince them that this is really a good story from, from our department. Yeah, fantastic. So top news uh, go to, to corporate communications and uh, news which is not considered a top news. Uh, that's something we we locally somehow distribute on through our channel. Mm. Very good. Um, it, this is a great question coming up here, um, and I'll answer. Uh, I'll let you answer first, and then I'll add my points to it. Um, are you concerned that researchers may try to adapt their work to achieve high altmetric scores or indicators, or could this be a good thing in some cases? Well, of course, you you could set up a bot that tweets about your article to increase uh, the score, the number, and the donut. But I think most researchers really care about their research. They, they want to focus on their research and they want to be bothered with administrative tasks. Uh, so I don't think there, there's misuse, um, at least from, from good researchers that do outstanding research. They don't want to waste their time uh, generating things like that. It's the same like with a citation. Uh, if you try to push your your age index uh, by getting more citations. There are some people, of course, that try to do it, but I think the average good scientist doesn't care too much about it. Yeah. 
Um, I should add that there are multiple forms of anti-gaming measures that Altmetric um, deals with. So, um, for example, if you were an, a researcher and you just simply shared a link to your article over and over and over again from your account, which is done uh, quite regularly, um, that obviously does not increase the score over and over and over again, because then we would simply have, like Joachim has pointed out, you know, you could just write a bot and, you know, tweet it out 10,000 times and then you have an enormous score, right? So that even doing that 10,000 times would get you a score of one because our, our system is clever enough to understand that. A lot of that is also done by Twitter itself. So they have bot detection. They demand that we uh, adhere to their data standards. In other words, if they consider something to be essentially false or fake or banned, uh, they will make us uh, conform to that data pool. Um, and so and a lot of that is, is sort of done in, on the high end by them. But we do the same thing, of course, within, um, you know, uh, uh, other areas as well. So, I mean, policy and Wikipedia are both items that don't contribute to the score beyond a certain level, partly because it's a different kind of attention. It's not a public level of attention, but it's an important one. So we still pick up every item, but we don't just inflate the score based on it because that attention um being able to put things in a certain order um uh, is is helped more by capturing the data but not by um, immediately uh, inflating numbers so that's certainly an important one um a question actually this relates to something you said joachim um i think it's probably a, a point of clarification um the question is do i understand that eth actually tailors their altmetric badge example, leaving out YouTube so that the badge is more meaningful. Is that what you meant by your phrase? Uh, no, 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 that's not, not at all what, what I meant. No, it's just when, when, I, uh, when I went through the sources, you know, for this report, for this internal report, we don't publish this. Then I, I was looking at some of the sources and uh, when I see, well, there's, there's something weird tonight and I just uh, leave it out. But I don't tailor the, the donut. I would just then look maybe at another example or so. But maybe what I mentioned earlier, you know, with the with the social media that people uh, don't use. So if someone if someone wants to know about their old metric score, and I see well you have 100 tweets, but he's not really interested in Twitter or in the in these counts, then I I would just uh, look at the other topics or the other platforms that that it's mentioned. But no, no, we would never ever do something. Uh, as, as a manual edit to a donut, it would also be very tedious. And <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't Maybe, do that. It'd be quite tricky, wouldn't it? I mean, I think you could probably manually do it with like Photoshop, but uh, I mean, <laughs> not, uh, our data is just sent the way it is, right? So, no. um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are some more questions. I will follow up with them ind independently. And I, of course, we will um, circle around with all of the um, answers to these questions in due course as well, along with the recording. Um, I have four links that I wanted to share. Before I do all of that, uh, Oliver, you ask him, do you have anything else that you would like to add before I sort of head to the to the final furlong, so to speak? Anything else you want to touch on? Maybe a small follow-up on the question that we had uh, before the last question. So whether um, the researchers mm -hmm. are actually uh, use, use old metric to promote their research more, I mean, I think it's important to say that this is very, very topic dependent, you know, something like a solar cell or a new battery or something related to healthcare is just much, much easier to get an altmetric, altmetric badge for, you know, and uh, here at our department, for instance, there is so much uh, important and at least for me, interesting fundamental research done, but this hardly gets an altmetric score. So these people wouldn't even be able to, you know, just try to increase and then kind of game the score. But on the other hand, if someone is, you know, making a new battery that could last triple time as long as the, the standard battery, why not? Why, why not should he then uh, actively promote a little more? But then on the other hand, I have to say, then the effort to promote this more is also um, also only a small effort in comparison to if you talk about the new X-ray method or something uh, something that has to do with, uh, you know, development of new catalysts, something that uh, gains a score less likely than a yeah. hot topic. Yeah. That's a that's a good point, actually. Yes, the altmetric details and scores do shift across different um, areas, just like they do with citations and impact factors. Um, you know, the, the 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 metrics for any particular research area do not behave equally across all research areas. And of course, we understand that. Well, actually, I, I until recently, until very recently, like uh, last week, I always used the the example of pure maths or uh, theoretical maths to be an example of where. Um, attention is not very high, but I came across um, 
an institute which was speaking with us that had really quite impressive scores for their total of 100 articles because the kind of math they're doing is um, answering questions like can you predict technological progress or does social media influence political outcomes and so even though it was actually it goes into just purely mathematical based questions there is no invention behind it there is no um, medical advance being uh, proffered um, instead we still actually saw some enormous take up across news so actually maths is not a good example always uh, so very, it almost comes down to the subject of the particular paper no matter what um, area it's in but there are of course course also general trends but yes that's a that's a great point um, I've got um, some links to the badges um, which I thought I would point out are free to use you don't have to use uh, our service uh, on an institutional level to have these this one was sent to me actually by the Open University um, this week I think it was they have embedded for the articles actually two of our um, services. So on one side, the altmetric badge, which is basically just a two lines of code embedded in the page that is reacting either to the URI or more likely to uh, the DOI if it's on here as well. But uh, there'll be basically enough on here for it to recognize uh, the, the DOI or the uh, REPEC ID or whatever it is. Um, we also have, by the way, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we have also built citations at Digital Science. We've built a citation badge for for the dimension service. So actually they've put both of these in. It's a shame this doesn't spiral around like this one does. <laughs> but um, it is the same team that built both. And of course, clicking on these will allow you to go and uh, see uh, the individual um, uh, details for those. Uh, let us know that you've done it because then we will, if there are uh, more than four mentions, we will um, actually, oh look, there's me. Uh, it's because, <laughs> yeah, here, this is how fast our service works. I was sharing uh, this page as a, an example of our badges uh, this morning, and it's already picked up uh, the fact that we've shared it. So there's attention for a different reason, you see. Um, so uh, those are, are freely available. Um, you can go to uh, api.altmetric.com forward slash embeds.html. I'll also send the link, of course, with uh, the rest of the materials. Help yourself. They are completely free for people to use. Um, we also relaunched our researcher data access program. Again, you don't have to be a customer of ours to use this. These are essentially because part of our mission is not just to you know produce a service and put it on the market um we also want to you know empower um, institutions researchers people who work in scientometrics to do research in this area as well we find that to be a, a, a good in and of itself and so uh, we've recently uh, relaunched this program for essentially one-time uh, uh, data access from our uh, API as a download in order for people to actually um, ask questions and do studies on um, uh, our particular items, particular pieces of research. So the metrics for particular items can be issued. Get in touch with, uh, if you just search uh, the Research Data Access Program, you can get in touch with Stacy Conkeel, who is the person who help, is helping with that. Um, similarly, Stacy also produced a more general website what are altmetrics.com so of course altmetric is the company um, but altmetrics alternative metrics in general is the field um, and here there are basically descriptions of what are they how are they used how can i find them how should they be used what resources are there it's all entirely free and it's written impartially uh, from the point of view of stacy as a actual researcher in this rather than somebody who happens to work for us now and who worked for, of course, Impact Story before that. So it's very well laid out just so you can orient yourself in the subject in general. Um, so we, we do cover things there. And then finally, um, just to put it on your screen, um, in case you are wondering what does go into that score, we did uh, back in 2015 write um, a, an extensive piece on how we actually uh, add uh, to this um, score. And back then we were still um, able to track LinkedIn um, and uh, what's seen a Weibo as well, which was uh, the Chinese version of Twitter. Both, unfortunately, along with Pinterest, have since deprecated their APIs. So we can't actually request from Pinterest or from LinkedIn have you seen this link? Have you seen this DOI? Um, that's an indirect answer to another question that was that was answered. And you can see here some of the weighting we've done. Uh, the weighting is purely as a measure of the qualitative difference between sources. It doesn't mean that if you're only in the news that you're somehow better. Um, it just is quantifying the noise level, the attention level you're probably getting. Again, I can send that around as well. Uh, and it goes into some of the stuff that we do with weighting and some of the uh, uh, gaming combating that we do as well. It's good fun. Um, 
so yeah and i think those are my four points um again uh, i will thank um our guests for um their time today thank you so much joachim and oliver it's great to um to see some of the stuff that you're uh, doing and judging by some of the questions uh, they've been called inspiring so that is wonderful I, I don't know if you uh, often get that feedback but it is actually quite inspiring people are saying that you are doing this kind of outreach so there you are thank you um, and yep my thanks also to the altmetric people who helped me set up this webinar and i will um circulate this uh, once we are uh, done uh, with the recording should go out sometime in the next day or two. We will also sit down and write up all the answers uh, to uh, the rest of the uh, questions that were out there. Um, and uh, we will um, see you on the road and in many other places. Uh, uh, we are always uh, on, yeah, well, I'm actually at the moment uh, at a conference, but we are always on the road at conferences. We're always doing webinars. You can reach out to us for any particular questions as well. And thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, everybody.